Okay, we're back. We're live. It's Monday, one o'clock rock, and you know what that means. You know what that means. That's research in Manoa. Where we talked to people who were doing research at the School of Ocean, Earth Science, and Technology at UH Manoa, and more specifically in the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, which we'd love to talk to them because they they think big. <coughs> <laughs> Sarah Fagans joins us today. She's a researcher for HIGP. Thank you for coming down. Absolutely. It's, it's great to be back. And our, and our uh, title today is um, Icy uh, vo 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 Volcanism. Volcanism, okay, on Jupiter's moon Europa. That's right. In case you were wondering. And Europa is named after Europe. Well, I think it's named after Zeus's lover or something like uh, that. The it's, original, it's before you. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, and you're researching, my goodness, you're researching this to find out about this icy, what is icy vol volcanism? What is that? Okay, um, the technical term that's been used in the literature is cryovolcanism. And Jupiter's moon, uh, Europa, is, has a lot of, of water on it, most of which is frozen at the surface. So it, it presents an icy surface. And similar to the way in which we have rock and magma producing volcanoes on Earth, on Europa we think we have ice as our surface crust and then eruptions of water through that ice onto the surface to produce this so-called icy volcanism or cryovolcanism. So how do you have an eruption of water? I mean, that'd be a whole different composition than Earth, right? Yeah, it's kind of difficult because actually on Earth, um, magma is less dense than rock, so it wants to rise up through the rock. Um, but on Europa, um, water is, is more dense than ice, so it wants to stay where it is under the ice. So we think we have to pressurize the water somehow to get it to the surface to produce these eruptions. Heat, maybe? Uh, heat, or if part of the ice starts to freeze, it pressurizes the interior, uh. or maybe if you've got um, gases dissolved within the water, it can, it can drive it up through a, a bubbly type of eruption. So there's, there's, it's, it's a, a big question mark. We don't really know how it operates, but we do see on the surface these really enigmatic features that suggests that fluids have come up from underneath the surface. So it's so interesting because we know, and I, you know, we know that there are certain things that are constant in our solar system mm. and maybe the whole universe, and that is, one is the periodic table of elements is the same on every planet, right? Right, right, right. Is it, you know, I, you, it's not that far away that it's different, it's the same. Right. The other thing is that the laws of physics, am I right about mm -hmm. this, are the same in our universe, yeah. I mean, in our, our solar system anyway. That's and, what we believe, yeah. And then, at the same time, though, you're saying that the process that happens on Europa is different than anything we see here on Earth. Yes, we, we think so. We think there's, there's very specific conditions on Europa that induce this kind of volcanism that we don't, we don't see on Earth. Um, and it's partly, I mean, partly a fact that, you know, Jupiter is, it's two planets out from us, it's, so it's in a colder part of the solar system. The moons there um, experience much different conditions. The surface temperature of Europa is something like minus 240 Fahrenheit. So the ice behaves like rock, the water behaves like magma. That's what we think. Anyway. Yeah, well, how interesting. How do you know stuff about Europa? I mean, we haven't been there, right? No, well, we've sent spacecraft, um, the Pioneer spacecraft very early on, then the Voyager spacecraft in the 1970s flew by the Jupiter system and then on out to the, the edge of the solar system and beyond. Um, and then in the 1990s, we sent the Galileo spacecraft, and Galileo was the first spacecraft to go into orbit around Euro uh, Jupiter. And uh, every so often when, when the orbit was favorable, it would fly past Europa and snap a bunch of photos and take other data, and it would fly past the other satellites as well. And so we got um, the first really consistent data back from, from that mission. And several things, uh, or several data sets told us really intriguing things about Europa. We saw the surface was covered in these cracks and these blotches. Um, the magnetic field that we measured at Europa suggested that there was actually a conducting water layer there. We didn't know there was an ocean of Europa until the Galileo spacecraft. Interesting. So, um, but because spectral imaging, you can see that it's water, is that why? Yes, yes, there was a spectrometer on board, and the, the signature from the surface is overwhelmingly water ice, but we do see these non-ice compositions there as well, salts, uh, sulfur, things like that, that are associated with the sort of splotchy dark patches on the surface. Do, do they, do, uh, you know, we had uh, Jeff Taylor and Linda Martell mm. a couple weeks ago, and talked about the creation of, of moons, I guess, of mm. moons of 
forget what planet it was, but it was moons. Right. And uh, do, you, do we have any idea about how Europa was formed originally? Would it yeah, come off Jupiter or what? Similar process as the solar system is forming, as Jupiter is forming, there's leftover debris in the orbit around Jupiter. And Jupiter has like something like 67 moons, most of which are m smaller than 10 miles across. So, you know, little residual chunks of rock floating around that didn't get either, it didn't, they didn't fall into Jupiter or they didn't get sort of amalgamated onto the other satellites. So it's leftover debris from the planetary uh, and solar system formation that, that, that produced these, these moons. Yeah. If I was a piece of space debris, I would r rather be associated with a large piece of space debris in a moon rather than just floating around myself. Right, It's just right. my... my <laughs> <laughs> and there still is some residual debris up there. Um, Jupiter has a ring system, uh, just in the same way that Saturn does, mm. but it's not as well developed as, as Saturn's ring system. But there are, there are rings of little chunks of rock and dust floating around in space there that never got sort of sucked up into the, the bigger bodies. This is fascinating. <laughs> is, is this a special planet for you? Jupiter and, um, and Europa? Yes. Um, when I was a postdoc, I was working for Ron Greeley at Arizona State, and he was one of the co-eyes on the imaging instrument on board Galileo. So that's when I first got my, uh, my first exposure to these icy moons of, of Jupiter. Um, and our job was to, to look at the brand new fresh images coming back, being beamed back down to Earth. Um, and look at them and just figure out what it was we were looking at. Um, like being a detective. Yeah, so, so it, was a, it was a very exciting time. Um, we were frequently completely confused by what we were looking at. <laughs> it, we, these were things that hadn't been seen before. Um, so yeah, that, that's why it's special for me. And uh, so I spent several years working um, on Europa during the Galileo mission. And um, I've always sort of had a fondness uh, for understanding these exotic forms of, of volcanism. Um, and I'm just now again starting to, to think more about cryovolcanism on Europa again. Yeah. Let's look at your slideshow. Mm. We have several slides. We're going to show them now, and you can tell us what they are. Okay. Okay, so this is, this is sort of the, the family portrait of the Galilean moons of Jupiter. There are four large moons of Jupiter. You can see that um, Europa is... Uh, Probably the, it's the smallest of these four, although, as I mentioned, there are lots of, of others. Um, and uh, this uh, graphic shows the interior structure of Europa. It's got an ice shell that's um, some probably tens of kilometers thick, and then a big layer of liquid water underneath it surrounding um, a rocky mantle and an iron, uh, iron sulfide core. And on the right-hand side of this graphic, you can see how uh, interesting, the geology of this surface is is very fractured. There's lots of mottled spots. There are very, very few impact craters from meteorites hitting the surface, and that tells us that the surface is very young, less than 100 million years, which is a geological blink of an eye compared to the 4.6 billion year age of the, uh, mm -hmm. the solar system. Mm -hmm. So that's what um, suggested to us this very youthful surface, suggested that there must be active geology resurfacing, recovering this surface, and so um, the, the puzzle was, the question was, what, what is this active geology? Yeah, but, but you, had, you had this dissected version, mm. a, a photo a chart yes. a drawing of, of, the, of the moon. Yeah. Um, how do you know what's inside? How do you know that wa the water layer is that deep? How do you know there's an iron core? How do you know that? We, drilling? What? No, no, there's, there's several lines of evidence. Um, first of all, we can tell by its orbital motion what kind of mass the body has, and that and we, we know what size it is as well. So from that, we can figure out a bulk density. And that bulk density um, is closer to that of rock than it is of, of other materials. So we know there's a large amount of rock in there. And then when we send spacecraft up there, um, the instruments they have on board and the trajectories around the, the bodies tell us, um, for example, gravity and magnetics tell us about the, the structure of the interior. The magnetics tells us that there's liquid water there um, and it must be um, a certain thickness to, to be able to conduct the electricity that we, we should make. part measure. of the detective work, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's a number of different lines of evidence, but that's <laughs> our, our current sort of best understanding of the, the, the structure. It's, it's too heavy, it's too dense to be just ice, so we know there's rock and metal in there as well. I don't, it's, so, it's so interesting. It's Sherlock Holmes. It really is. I can imagine how exciting it is to 
to have confirmation of one, you know, theoretical fact that you learn mm. from one source, and then you have another source, and hmm, it confirms the first conclusion. Right. And now you know a little better, a little more confidence about what's up there. And yeah, you, can, you just add each little piece <clears throat> of evidence up uh, over time, and then you can start to be more confident in your, in your assertions. Great. That's exciting. Mentally exciting, I think. <laughs> We're going to take a short break, Sarah. Okay. Sarah Fagan, she's a researcher at HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. They like coming out mm -hmm. and telling us what they're doing. We really appreciate that. We're going to take a minute, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what is likable about science. We bring on scientists of all ilk, astronomers, physicists, chemists, biologists, ecologists, and they talk about their work, and more importantly, they talk about why you should talk about their work, why you should think about their work, why you should like their work. I help them bring out why their work is understandable, why it's meaningful, why people should care about it, why people should support science. We have a good time. We talk about current uh, events of interest. We talk about uh, historical events sometimes. We dig deep into their research, why they do, what the joys and delights and frustrations of their work are. And in all, we, we show a, a real world of science, a real world of likable science. I hope you'll join us every Friday at 2 p.m. One, we're back. <laughs> Sarah Fagans, researcher at HIGP in the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology, talking about mm, icy volcanism on Jupiter's moon, Europa. Wow, we're way out there on this one. <laughs> So let's go back to the slideshow. What have you got? Okay. Okay, so this is um, a shot of some of the surface features of Europa. Europa is, um, is about 2,000 miles across, a little bit smaller than our own moon, but looks very, very different from our own moon, as you can see. There's um, these, these lineaments. Um, this is a, a false color image, I should say, which is uh, enhanced to show the compositional differences. Europa, as I mentioned, is predominantly waterized, but these darker reddish colored areas are areas where we see different compositions, salts, um, some sulfur compounds, things like that. So it's a very, um, very young, very tortured surface. The graphics on the right at the, sh at the top show some zoomed in areas. Um, these, these pits and spots, we see these, these uh, we started off calling them freckles during the, the Galileo era. Freckles, did you? Yes. They look like freckles, um, they do. Uh, so uh, we actually ended up, they were called lenticuli, which is a more um, okay. official sounding name. <laughs> but if you zoom in on those, the three little panels below the top right um, show what these things look like at very close quarters. They're about, you know, uh, three miles, four miles, five miles across. And they look like material has been oozed up and pushed out onto the surface. And you can see the background ridges. It's a very tectonically active um, place as well. The bottom on the right shows a zoomed in area of, of the south, uh, uh, the southern hemisphere of Europa. And we can see these dark, lobate, muddy looking features, which um, before we had the very high resolution data were thought to be flows of material over the surface. But when we look closely, we see it's actually disruptions of the surface, chaos, the, the surface has broken up and, and been moved around, um, so-called chaos terrain. Uh, and we think there's been some liquids released at the margins, the very dark margins of these features as well. Mm -hmm. If I were there, if I were, not that I would be, but if I could be and would be, what would what would it be like? Is that is that going to be some kind of different color of rock? Is um, it going to be some kind of lava kind of be, thing? It would be a subtle um, color change. As I mentioned, those are enhanced color images um, so that we can pick out um, differences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it will be uh, largely sort of shades of gray. I think um, some of the surface is very bright, white, pure ice. Uh, ranging to sort of uh, uh, more grayish colored ice. So, you, you know, the idea about taking a photograph and then enhancing the color mm. helps you scientifically yes. to make the distinction between one, one, one thing and another. No? Mm. Yeah, when we take images of the surface, we take them in many different um, wave bands in, in the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's not just uh, broadband uh, visible light. We take it some in the near infrared through to the, the near UV, um, and when you combine, you take multiple images, when you combine those in different ways, it can, it can pull out uh, 
features that, that tell you about the composition, because different compositions respond in different ways to, to light in different ways. Right, and you can see more if you process that, that yes. photograph. Yes, yes, that's right. So uh, am I going to be able to take pictures like this with my 12 me megapixel camera? <laughs> um, I know some cameras nowadays have like a like an infrared setting, but usually the, the, the filters on these cameras are broad, yeah. uh, broad wavelength. So yeah. So you catch everything with a camera yeah. like this, yeah. and and uh, and looking at the photographs, I mean uh, these are very detailed, high resolution mm. photographs. You can see mm, you know, tons of stuff with that. Yeah, with the, with the Galileo imagery. Um, because the, the way the Galileo mission worked was that it was orbiting Jupiter and would swing by Europa every once in a while, but at different distances and at different um, positions so on the catch planet. catch can. Yeah, so we had, on the very close flybys, we had images that were as good as 10 meters per pixel. Um, so we could get little tiny areas of the surface at very high resolution, but um, the more global coverage is um, at around 20, 200 meters per pixel and, and lower than that. So even so, we can see you know a, a lot of detail um, in those 200 meter per pixel images. Can you give us an idea of how big uh, Europa is? I mean, diameter, circumference? Yeah, it's about 1,900 miles diameter. Um, so it's a, a, a few hundred miles less than our own moon. Um, so it's quite a small body, which uh, makes it surprising uh, that it's so geologically active. And, and part of the reason for that is its position in the Jupiter system. Um, you have Jupiter in the center, and then as you go out from Jupiter, you have Io, which is the very volcanically active moon, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And Europa experiences gravitational stresses between Europa's gigantic gravity and then the gravity of the other moons nearby. Which so is less. Yeah, which is less, but it, as they go around their orbits, it's experiencing, it, it passes by Io, it passes by Ganymede, and it's experiencing this gravitational attraction which, which stresses the surface of Europa, and this causes those cracks, we think, that we see, the very long linear moves. Striations. Yes, and it also uh, induces a, a heating, a frictional heating in the interior, which we think is why there's liquid water there in the first place. Um, it's too cold out there for liquid water just to stay liquid. There has to be this continual uh, frictional heating because of this gravitational flexing. So now let's get to the big, the big point here. Mm. You have some evidence to suggest there are microbes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. Don't say that. But um, <laughs> to, the, the <laughs> well, to conjecture <laughs> that there are maybe microbes. The speculation is um, Europa has, surprisingly, look, Europa has more liquid water on it than the Earth does. And we know on Earth where everywhere, everywhere. And when you say water, you're saying the same thing we got here, yeah. H2O. H2O plus or minus, you know, salts, like the ocean here is salty. Yeah. Um, and on Earth, wherever we see water, we see life. So Europa is arguably the most plausible place in our solar system other than the Earth to find life because it has this huge, global, salty ocean. Uh, and so there's intense interest to go back to Europa to sample this ocean if we can. You mean get down there? Get down there. I mean, that may be some way off, but there's ways we can determine the composition of the ocean without actually getting into the ocean. Um, and, and try to figure out if it is uh, not just a habitable environment, but if it is in fact ha inhabited. Wouldn't um, that be something? Yes, it would, it would. It you know, would. imagine, you imagine is that yours or mine? Oh, mine. oh okay, well. Um, and if, if, um, if there is life on Europa, and we're talking microbes, we're talking bacteria, we're not talking, you know, the Loch Ness Monster or anything like that, but if there is life in that ocean, it in all likelihood evolved independently of life on Earth, um, which suggests that the evolution of life is not... Limited a, to Earth. Yeah, it's not a terribly unique thing. So yeah. if you go to other stars, other solar systems, um, yeah. who knows what might be, might be going yeah. on there too. <clears throat> but uh, this really makes my head hurt. But <laughs> So if, if you found a microbe there, mm -hmm. Um, it, it would be the result of, um, you know, the water and the heat in the water and maybe some nutrients of some exactly, kind. Yeah. And uh, that microbe could give rise to a whole planet full of life yeah, over who time. Knows? Who knows, yeah. Um, it's, it's certainly mind-blowing to contemplate, yes. You know, and, and what it suggests to me, I mean, just 
you know, this planet is sort of barren right now. There's nothing much going on in terms of life. You, mm -hmm. don't, you don't see any. But then Earth was too. Uh, absolutely, Wait, yeah. And so if you had a microbe and, and then you have a dead microbe and maybe some nutrients, then now there's two microbes and one is feeding off the decay of the other one, right? right. And all of a sudden you have foliage and, and then it gets uh, of higher levels of life. And before you know it, you have something like Earth, but it wouldn't be the same. They would probably have three eyes or something, right? <laughs> Well, I think, I think, you know, out at Europa, because it's so cold out there, I think that probably limits how far down the evolutionary scale you can go. Um, so, and it certainly wouldn't be something that humankind would witness, I don't no, think, no. Uh, evolving. Sure, because time. it's going to be very far in the yeah, future. Yeah. Hundreds of millions of years, probably, or something yeah. like that, yeah. So let's look at some more photographs, now that I'm all provoked. <laughs> We'll see some more. Okay, well, you okay tell us what so we got. this is an artist's conception of, of what might be going on in the interior of Europa. Um, you see Jupiter in the background and then Io, volcanic Io in the background too. So we have this very cold surface crust that's probably minus 240 Fahrenheit at the surface. But then as you go deeper down into the ice, the ice starts to get warmer and you have the liquid water layer at the bottom. So this is uh, just an idea of what kinds of processes might be going on. There might be cracks propagating to the surface that allow water to erupt. Uh, through vents on the surface. And then on the right-hand side, those sort of blobs of lightish blue within the ice, that's, that's mm -hmm. uh, an artist's rendering of, of how warm ice might buoyantly rise up to the surface. And in both cases, in the case of water going to the surface or warm blobs of ice going upwards, they impact the, the surface geology that we see, the surface geomorphology that we see, and produce um, features that we observe on, on the surface. So we see them, we're trying to put together physics models of how they form, and these are the kinds of ideas that we, we try and put numbers to. And, th and those uh, those sprays, uh, that's water erupting, right? Is that, th is that what yes. the rendition is? Yes, because um, we actually in the last couple of years have evidence from Hubble Space Telescope images um, that there are in fact active vents of water vapor um, on the surface of Europa. Um, which is incredibly um, intriguing results and suggests that when we do go back to Europa with a spacecraft, we can sample those plumes mm. and there may be, um, not only will understand what the composition of the ocean water is, but there may be organics within those plumes as well. So mm. that would give us an idea of, of what is, is down in that ocean. That's a way of sampling the ocean without getting into the ocean. How high are the plumes? Is it miles? Um, yeah, they're, uh, let's see, up to about 200 kilometers. So, wow, um, that's you know, serious eruption. Yeah, yeah. So, so they're very, very large. Is there an atmosphere? Um, not, not as such. There, there are particles of gas around the surface. Um, but not, not anything you really call an atmosphere. And Matt Damon couldn't do very much with this at all, could he? No. <laughs> no, he couldn't. No, he couldn't. Um, and actually, one of the, of the graphics I've got, will, um, it shows the, the evidence for these plumes that have Let's been look. released. we got a couple more. Okay, so um, this was really, really, really exciting stuff. Um, back in the Galileo era, we looked really hard for plumes above the surface, and we didn't find any. <clears throat> but back in um, 2012, some images on the left here were acquired in the Hubble Space Telescope. Is that X-rated or something? You have those little <laughs> artifacts there? <clears throat> well, Is it something we can't see, don't want to see? <laughs> not exactly. It's not that exciting. But, um, <laughs> What this shows is a composite of um, the, the, the pixelated area is, is an area that was observed in the Hubble image of uh, vapor, um, hydrogen and oxygen, above the surface of Europa that was being um, illuminated by the magnetic field of Jupiter. So this was the first det uh, detection by a guy called Lawrence Roth from Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas. And he looked in three sets of images, and only once did he detect these pixels represent that water vapor. So then there was a great deal of uh, interest in, in re-examining um, these images, because because we only he only saw it once out of three times. Mm -hmm. That could suggest that um, it was a transient event that turned off, turned on, and then turned off again, or that there was some kind of instrument problem, and, and sure, we didn't that's know whether to trust the yeah. results yeah. or not. So then there was a campaign of observing to um, try and find these plumes again. And in 2014, um, William Sparks and his group um, uh, from the Space, Science, uh, Space Telescope Science Institute in, in Baltimore, Maryland, um, 
used a completely different way of, of observing Europa. They observed Europa crossing in front of Jupiter, and the light bouncing off of Jupiter could illuminate any water vapor that might be around Europa. So um, that image on the right was another, a highly processed image that removed the background image of Ju uh, Jupiter, but left uh, along the South Pole these enhanced pictures. You can pictures. see much more detail with that. Yeah. Yeah. So the two independent ways of, of observing these plumes found in, in the latter uh, instance by Sparks, they found, I think, three instances in uh, 2014 where they observed these plumes out of 10 observing runs. So um, this, this provides a lot more evidence that there are, in fact, these water plumes venting from the surface of Europa in the South Polar region. Um, which provides a lot of impetus for, for NASA's upcoming uh, Europa mission to, to go back and be able to sample those plumes. When is that? Well, <clears throat> this mission, the next mission is currently in development. It's been selected, um, so they're, they're developing their instruments now. Um, it should launch in sometime in the 2020s. It will take some number of years to get there. I'm not sure what the projected orbit is, but it could be five, six, seven years to get there. Uh, and then it will go into orbit around Jupiter again, but the flybys are de designed to focus on Europa. So it will do something like 45 flybys and image uh, at very high resolution. Um, Send it back by, by radio transmission. <laughs> yes. So you, you don't have to wait for the, the uh, satellite spaceship to get back. No, a space, a spaceship won't come back. Oh, it won't <laughs> it, come back. It's a one-way trip for that poor spaceship. Oh, poor, uh, <laughs> poor spaceship. <laughs> but it'll, it'll stay there for several years and... Um, uh, spend a, a lot of time focusing on answering these questions. Um, how deep is that ice layer? How deep is it to the ocean? Can we sample the plumes? Okay. This is a graphic that shows that an artist's rendering of, of the uh, oh, Europa at. multiple flyby mission. Yeah. The two big panels coming out of the side of the spacecraft here. Um, Solar. No, ice, ice uh, penetrating radar. Um, ah, how so, interesting. Uh, the idea is to use this ice penetrating radar, uh, the antenna, sorry, at the bottom of the panels, I should say, um, to d figure out how thick that ice shell is and how, how deep you might have to go to actually um, uh, sample the ocean. And in kind of an unprecedented move, um, when uh, Congress was asked to approve this mission, they also said, you gotta do a lander as well. So this would be an orbiting mission, but they, there's a study underway right now to figure out how costly it would be, how much it would cost to put a lander on the surface and to land this, this spacecraft in an area that seems to be geologically active and directly sample um, perhaps the, the organics, the, the um, molecules that, that might suggest a, a biotic uh, this environment. Is, this is very exciting. It is. You're doing very exciting work. <laughs> Thank you for sharing it with us, Sarah. Sure. And, and I hope you come back and give us you know more of the you know, the points along the way. Absolutely. And we don't want to wait till 2020. We, we <laughs> want it before then. Okay, I will do. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Sarah Fagans, HIGP SOS, thank you so much for coming down. Aloha.